Welcome to Our Town, a 30-minute podcast brought to you by Best Bark Communications, a small but fierce client-centered marketing company powered by decades of experience and well-established business networks. This is Andy Ockershausen, and this is Our Town. And I keep saying to everybody, and our guest today is a very special guy that I've listened to for years. He never worked with me at WMAL, but that was our fault, not his. Andy Poland. And Andy, I keep saying, our town is Dale City. It's Upper Marlboro. It's Upper Northwest. It's 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 a huge place. Six million people we have in our town. And we're delighted that you're with us, Andy. And I'm delighted you're back on the air regularly. Well, it's nice of you to say that, Arkansas, and it's... Quite a surprise that Beatrice and I are no longer here, and you still are. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, I survived them all. Yeah. The truth is, that, that's that voice you used. Most sickly used to come in and ask for Felix Grant. He'd been dead for four or five years. <laughs> he, he would do crazy things like yeah, that. Yeah. But Ken didn't have that much sense of humor. But Andy, you are a fountain of information. Some may say trivia, but I've listened to you for years talk about things about Redskin games that came out of your memory as a young man growing up, or a young boy growing up in Washington. Yeah, I, I did grow up here. Uh, my father also grew up in D.C., went to Central High School. Oh, did I know it? And saw Sammy Ball play. And so his love of the Redskins was transferred to me. And we went to our first game, I think it was 1968. And it was freezing cold, and the Redskins were terrible. And <laughs> those I made were the them, years. I made them stay till the end of the game. They won, and uh, yeah, I've been hooked ever since. So he and I, he worked a lot, and uh, Sundays we always watched the games together. What was your dad? Was he in business? He is in. Uh, well, now he's still he's still alive, and he owns apartments. But for many years, he worked for the George Hyman Construction Company. Oh wow! And uh, and so when the big executives didn't want their tickets at the end of the year, that's when we'd get them. So we always went to wow. the last game of the year. Well, didn't Hyman do a lot of work at George Washington University? I yeah. can see their signs down there. Oh yeah, yeah. It's Jim. It's owned, it was later on by Jim, Jim Clark. Clark who right. He took away. over it's the now Clark Construction. Changed is, the name. They're was, worldwide now. Oh, they're huge. Your Honestly. dad. Well, he doesn't work anymore. Of course. No, he he, uh, he still actually is running apartments that he owns that he inherited from my grandfather. Wow. Who built those in 1943 when there was, and this is old During school, the so, war. Yeah, because, and you know this, that there was a housing shortage in D.C. Oh, oh, did I know it? Because of the war effort. And so if you went to the bank and you said, I'd like to build apartments, they say, how much money do you need? Now, the idea for my grandfather to do this was given to him by Morris Poland, his younger brother, who was the father of Abe Poland. Morris, of course, became very Correct. successful. Abe even more so, which brings me to our first connection between the two of us. And this is like the 1980s. I'd come back from working in Texas. I'd worked in... Well, Beaumont. we want a fair, but how did you get to Texas, Michael? Well... Michael. Andy. Andy. Thanks, thing. Bill. Uh, <laughs> he was sitting in... Michael O'Hara was sitting in that seat. I lost it. Yeah, I'm me sorry. and Michael O'Hara are often confused. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's another story in itself. Do you want to hear that? No, I want to hear about why did you go to Texas? That's what I was going to give you. Oh, okay. That's, yeah, that's what I want to hear. So there, there's a guy, and this is old school as well, a, a 85, 86. He worked at Channel 5. He was between Bernie Smilovitz and Steve Buckhans. His name was Joe Fowler, and you can see him now still doing infomercials on TV. I remember the name, Joe yeah, Fowler. He looked like Joe Theismann in those days, who had just uh, finished his career. And so he and I went to school at American University. He's from San Antonio. In between semesters of my sophomore year, he went home to San Antonio to do the Dodgers. They have a double-A team or had a double-A team there and do their broadcasts. And while he was home, he was offered this job in Beaumont, Texas. He said, I'm not going to take that, but I know somebody who might be interested. So on Christmas Day. Is Beaumont on the river? It's not on the river, is no, it? No, it's on the Gulf. It's like yeah, I know I've heard around about ninety somewhere. miles east of Houston, right? And so uh, on Christmas Day, where I'm usually watching movies and eating Chinese, uh, <laughs> I went to I went to the studio and I I made a tape and I sent it off to the guy he told me to send it to, and I wound up in Beaumont, Texas, worked there for a year. I had to promise my parents I'd finish school. I had two and a half semesters to go or two and a half years to go, and uh, I finished at Trinity University in San Antonio. Worked big at, school. Worked at WOAI there. And then from there, I went to Dallas. Wait a minute, WOAI is a powerful station yeah. in San Antonio. Yeah, I, I know there. those call letters. I was there for two years or three years, actually. And then I went to uh, Bo Dallas for two years. 
And after that ended, there was a format change. They had to bring us into the TV studio to fire us all at once. We didn't have a room big enough for <laughs> What the were radio. the call letters there? WFAA. Powerful TV, it, too. Yeah. That's and Channel it's, 8, isn't it? Channel 8, right. And uh, so I came back home, and I went to see Abe Poland about a job. And he says, well, I'm not really in the radio business, but I have a friend named Andy Ackershausen. <laughs> so while I'm in his office, he calls you. And, and I think you, you said, look... I got Johnny Holiday bugging me for work as it is. I don't I don't need your cousin to come bothering me. So tell him to go find himself a real job. I don't think you said that. But I they, made a big mistake. But no, I don't think so. But that at, at the time that that was what the situation was and I wound up working at UPI. UPI had a radio network. Very good network. And they sure. were located at 14th and I and I stayed there for about 3 years I think the first time around, got married. And then, but you came back to our town. That's well, what's important. But I, I took another detour. Um, there was a two-line article in the fanfare section of the Post. Remember the little tidbits that you get Very in the front well. there. And they said that there was a radio station, WHN in New York, which was a country station, which was going to go all sports. It was the first all sports station in the country. So I looked in the media guide, the blue books that they put out for media for basketball and football, and there was a listing of, of a, one person working at WHN who was doing the Mets pre and post games. His name was Howie Rose, who's gone on to become the longtime voice of the Mets, and he did the Islanders oh for years. God. And so he picked up the phone, and I must have been the 300th person to call, and he just blurted out the address and who to send the tape to, and he hung up. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I quickly wrote down the name and the address, and I sent a tape, and I wound up going to to the first sports station in the country, WFAN. And uh, the fan. and then then they started in in 1992, the Rails Brothers, who owned wow. WGMS AM and FM, know it quite well. They they saw the success of the fan, and they said, let's convert the AM of WGMS to sports. It was 570. And so they hired as a consultant, my former boss at WFAN, he hired me and they, we hired a bunch of people and the rest is history. Well, I lived through that with Catherine Malloy. Yep. Do you remember Kathy, of course, and what she did with the station. Um, Andy, that, you know, listen to your story reminds me only because you took the long way to get where you are. There's no shortcut. I keep telling the people that you got to get your skills somewhere. If you can't, you can't get it in the top market. It's impossible. It's hard. You, you can get get started. But I always wanted to be a sports announcer, and I was working for Jim Gibbons, who was the WMAL's morning man, mm -hmm. and he did the Redskins in Notre Dame. Right. And he advised me, look, you want to get by in life, don't get into sports announcing. <laughs> get into sales. That's where the money is. The where the stability is. And I would tell you that was in the early fifties. Wow. Well, and I never regretted it. The, I miss being in sports, but we became a sports station because of Jim. The, the, the concept in the 50s of all sports would have been insane. Because, Absolutely. Because, and if you know radio, how, how that has changed. But at that time, you were trying right to attract as many listeners as you possibly could. Correct. And not that there aren't women who are sports fans, but when you go to a sports format, you're basically eliminating a big section of your of your potential audience, right? Absolutely. Yeah. It's a numbers game. Andy, the same thing in television. We used to tell the guys at Channel 7, you do a great job, but maybe 10% of the audience watching our newscast is interested in sports. The other 90%, that's not why they tune us in. Right. In fact, that may be the sports might have us tune us out. And you know, we went through a bunch of sports announcers in the early days and then finally figured it out that if we're going to do sports, you got to do it on radio. You ain't going to make it on television. Well, we, but we had a unique situation in this town for about 10, 12 years where you had Glenn Brenner, George Michael, oh and Frank God. Herzog all finding their audience, all doing well, and all making lots of money on television. That doesn't exist anymore. They all worked. Worked hard at their jobs. Too. Right, right. Probably uh, the hardest worker would have been George. I mean, he was a yeah. a, a, a taskmaster and a trailblazer. I mean, he's he's he, what he did with video is is the is way it, sports well, is done today. He started today. cable television, didn't even know it, right? right, right. What were the Sports Authority? Sports. Um, what is that? Sports, sports machine. Sports machine. Yeah. We lived through it. But Andy, when you came back to Washington and talked to Abe. Of course, I, I apologize. I made a mistake. No, you didn't. Everybody makes a mistake. 
I didn't. What did hear the people I rejected? I rejected Rich Eisen once. <laughs> I remember watching an audition of a show at Channel 7. I said, this thing will die. It'll never get anywhere. It was called Hee Haw. I said, that's the word. How many did it last? It lasted 20 years, yeah, didn't right. it? Found and its everybody audience. made money. Yeah. And Jimmy Dean and Texas Wildcats. I said, nobody's going to listen to Jimmy Dean. Yeah. Guess what? He became the... The pork king of the world. How about that? A WMAL guy, incidentally. Was he? Really? he worked for Chad. He had a radio show with Connie B. Gay, and he did the TV show on WMAL TV, which is now Gay LA. Yeah. Andy, what, what, how, why did you never go to television with any regularity? You seen this face? <laughs> it's a perfect face. No, I, I've, I've had uh, some TV work. What I found over the years is um, I've, I've gotten various freelance TV things, and they come and they go, and I never really worry about them too much. Radio has been really stable for me, you know, especially since I've come back to town. So uh, I've, I've never really made a, a huge effort to get into well, television. I think you did the right thing because, you know, your radio career, I have watched you from afar. I don't know what was going on at uh, whatever they call the callers, FAN. No. Yeah. What were the callers? Um, WTEAM? WTEM. And then they changed it to something else. Well, it's still officially WTEM. Yeah, that's but, the FCC callers. Yeah, but it's it's ESPN 980. And I which... said, where is Andy Poland? What? <laughs> why would they do something that takes him away from an audience that always was listening to him? Because... Our, our staff photographer, Mary Pat Collins, her father is a great fan of yours. His the business, Pat Michael Collins? Collins. Yeah, Michael Collins. Oh. Michael Collins. Oh, I was going to say. Big, big bucks. Michael's got a big bit then. And um, he was a great fan and always has been. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, well, do you know what's going on? I said, I don't know what's going on. But why would you destroy something that's working for something that may is a risk? Well, and then, it's, you know, they, then you ended up on, I know the story of 570. 570 I know it yeah. quite well. But you know, you you you've been in this business forever. You know how it works, and decisions are made by people who think they're doing the right thing at the time. Oh, but I there's realize no, that. There's no there's no blueprint to do it the right way, and they make mistakes. And the good thing is, all the people that wanted to get rid of me are no longer there anymore. <laughs> so you have left. So the, this, love it. the 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 uh, joy of getting back into my old spot <laughs> is is enhanced by the fact that they're not there anymore. It tells you something, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, Andy, we're going to be right back. We're going to take a break here in our cast and uh, talk more about our town and about your impact on our town. This is Andy Ockershausen, and we're talking to Andy Poland. Hi, Tony Sybil here to tell everybody about our wonderful restaurants at Washington Harbor. Tony and Joe's, the best seafood in the city. Nick's Riverside Grill, wonderful chops and steaks, wonderful views of the Kennedy Center, Roosevelt Island, the Roslyn Skyline, spectacular. Two bars outside, right on the water. Fabulous food. For dinner reservations, call 202-944-4545. It's really a great experience. We'll see you down at Tony and Joe's or Nick's Riverside Grill. You're listening to Our Town with Andy Ockershausen. This is Our Town with uh, Andy Poland, the star of whatever the call letters are now, Andy. ESPN 980. ESPN 90, the Redskins Radio. There you go. And uh, the rest. But, you know, th that happens in your life in broadcasting. I guess the WML was sort of a, a kooky or freak place because nobody left. I mean, our, our staff was intact for maybe uh, steady 25 years. It's amazing. It doesn't happen anymore, Andy, in the broadcast. No, it doesn't. But what you built was something that was a pillar in the community. And you had everything that everybody wanted. You had the best hosts, the funniest people, the, the you had the Redskin games, and this doesn't happen anymore. But it was routine for people to turn down the sound on their television and listen to Sonny, Sam, and Frank. Yeah. And and we promoted that that ad infinitum about how different that would be, and it worked. It was great, and we, it, we had audience. It was it was the soundtrack of the eighties for for especially for sports in this town. I mean, you you think about about the success that they had, and when you think back, sure you think about Riggins and Theismann and Dexter and all those guys. But what plays in your head is touchdown Washington Redskins and the great banter between Sonny and Sam and and how everybody made sure that they listened to Ken's analysis after the game. He didn't have time to watch the film. <laughs> no. but, but he had you believing that he broke it down and he told you how this special <laughs> teamer did. 
did and that special team were done and, and the unsung hero was Torgy Torgerson and you went, oh my God, this is a young... He sold it. Yeah, he it, was, sold it. it was great. It was great. Most of the games he never saw anyway. Nah. He would say he couldn't stand television. He would watch it with the sound down. Remember yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Or, or at a home game, he said he wouldn't sit in the press box. He would sit in the stands. Yeah. <laughs> Ken, well, we all made fun of Ken, but he was part of what we were. We didn't apologize. We had a jingle that we paid money for to turn your radio down and listen to Sonny, Sam, and Frank. And sometimes we said Frank, Sam, and Sonny. And sometimes we said Sonny, Frank, and Sam. It, yeah. it was always the three. You can, it you came can as one word. still do it, but you have to basically pause your television set to sync it up. Correct, because that delay. And delay, and now, now it, you know, in, in your time, you could just simply turn down it. the sound and, and you know, listen to the game. And the Redskins knew it, and they loved it because they loved the broadcast, and they, you know, because network television took over the home team. Right. You know that. Yeah. And the announcers were changed from week to week. They didn't know who the hell it was going to be. But those three guys were there all the time, as, as bad as Ken was. But, Andy, <laughs> your knowledge of the team goes back so far, and you pull out names that I hear. I mean, Torgy Torgerson. <laughs> there are probably not three people <laughs> in the city of Washington know remember Torgy. I remember well, him very well. Torgy, had, Torgy was a player with the Redskins, and I think he was like on three or four different coaching staffs. Very talented man. The head coach would change, and they, they liked what he was doing with the defensive line, and they kept him aboard, and I, I'll bet you he was for 20 years, a uh, and, you know, and your wife has Vince Permuto. That's Permuto with a T, not Permuto. But <laughs> Vince Permuto was an offensive lineman, not a defensive lineman, and uh, and was named one of the 70 greatest Redskins of all time, as a matter Do of fact. Do you believe that? You know, we got – we. Charlie Brown and I got Vince in the Redskins Hall of Fame at the at the baseball thing. Mm-hmm. Vince, people say, "Why would you do that?" He was not a big star. I said, "He was to us because he was connected." Yeah, they knew what we meant to. Yeah. I love Vince. Oh, he was a good player. He was about ten year ten yeah, year Redskins. Right, he yeah. played. He was he was very very acceptable. He really good to Holy Cross. He was a good boy from uh, New York. Right, and he became a district attorney or something in New York. Did he not? I th- I think so. I think he did have a legal position. And and there's a story. Uh, that has been told about Sam Huff for many years, which Vince Permuto says is not actually true. And there was a famous game between the Redskins and the Giants, uh, I think it was 1966, and the final score was 72-41. to 41. And, RFK. Uh, uh, well, it was D.C. Stadium then. Right. It was right. It, I mean, later named RFK. And it was 69-41, and time was running out, and you'd think, oh, just take a knee and run out the clock. Now, they called timeout. So that Charlie Gogolak could kick a field goal to make it 72 to 41. And when asked about it after the game, Otto Graham said, well, I thought he needed the practice. Sam Huff said, well, I was so mad that Ali Sherman had traded me <laughs> after the 63 season. I wanted to rub it in their faces and score as many points as we could. So I was the one who called timeout so that Gogolak could kick the field goal. Vince Permuto was the offensive captain. And as the offensive captain, he's the only one who was on the field able to call timeout <laughs> Huff was a defensive player he was not on the field so actually it was Permuto who called the timeout Time and, and had him kick the field goal and that is a story that's been around forever yeah. correct yeah, and, I and, love and, the and story Sam, Sam told it forever and, and, and highest scoring game in the history of the pro sports I think it still is yeah it still is Andy that see that's the kind of thing you can bring back to your listeners that I can't understand when you were doing it why well, I don't want to go back into that <laughs> that uh, whatever the, the management does, management does. But I'm so glad you're back. But you mentioned in Sam, I happened to see Sammy Ball. I saw him practice at Anacostia Playground a long, long time ago. But the Redskins used to practice at a public playground. Oh, yeah. Because they didn't have a state. Well, when Redskins Ray, Park. Ray Flaherty was the coach. Ray Flaherty, who won the, the first two championships with the team. But when George Allen built Redskins Park, yes, I think it was called did. Redskin Park. For some reason they call it Redskins Park now. But when that was built in 1971, that was one of the first of its kind in the, in the country, whole country. Country, and if you if you look back at some old photos of like the 60s, there's a field outside of DC Stadium where they're <laughs> they're practicing, and and there were I've heard stories of guys who who walked up and said, "Hey, you need an extra guy? I used to play a little college football. <laughs> sure, we'll have you run some pass routes and so forth." And I uh, am sure that happened. Yeah, and a lot a lot changed in 71 when Allen came aboard. Well, Allen said that he heard about. It, uh, uh, not hurt. He saw it with his own eyes when the Rams came here to play. The team had practiced on his field right by the jail. Right. And he said, "I don't think we should do that." He said to Ed Williams, "We got to build." Remember, Williams is the one brought him here. Right. 
We probably at Cook's insistence. Everybody yeah. knows the whole story. But the, dude. as the story goes, uh, Edward Bennett Williams said to George Allen, "You have an unlimited budget." <laughs> and when he decided not to renew his contract in 1977, he said, "Yes, I gave him an unlimited budget, and he exceeded it." <laughs> 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 and there were no draft picks left. No. And and, but and he, he had a winner. He had a winner. And that's and, what the public wanted. Well, and and you know, people look at what Redskin mania is now, and 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 it's amazing that it has survived the last 20 years years of, of, of mediocrity success. but what happened here is he came here in 1971 now they had a winning season under Lombardi in 69 but he died of cancer and 1970 Bill Austin was the interim coach and they had a losing season so Allen comes aboard and he looks at what had been basically 25 years of mediocrity partly because George Preston Marshall didn't want to have any blacks on the team so Correct. no shock they won one game in a year you know <laughs> things like that and and Allen said look the future is now he said, we're going to win right now. And he went to work right away trading draft picks for his old veterans. You know, and they came in by the busload. The Ramskins. Ramskins. whole bunch of Richie Pettibone and Ron McDole. Well, McDole was from the Bills, but um, he, had, he had about five or six guys from the Rams. And then Billy Kilmer came in. Uh, from New from Orleans, New right? New Orleans, yeah. And, and Sonny got hurt in that preseason. And... They went five and zero oh in their first five games. Now, because of the way the schedule was, somehow those games were all on the road at the beginning of the I year. I remember the Kansas City they beat, and they had a they had like five thousand people go to Dulles to see the team come back. See, now Kansas City was the game they lost. Oh, was it? That's the it, game Charlie Taylor broke his ankle in. Wow! And, see and that they, he's a fa- <laughs> he's a he's a man's a book. And they lost that game, but they had been five and zero. Oh, and George Allen was on the cover of Newsweek magazine, and it said, "The future is now." And the, the the hysteria in this town over that one of the early wins too was against Dallas. And, oh yeah, and beating Dallas that was that Allen knew because they were defending champions, and Allen said that this is the team that we have to beat. And they went to Dallas and beat them. So, yeah, 5,000 people at Dullis Airport to, to greet the team. I knew it was one of the games. Yeah. They, and, unbelievable. And so, you know, I mean, it, the years under Gibbs were, were marvelous. They were fantastic. Right. But the foundation for that was laid by George Allen in the early 70s. And he had the backing of uh, Ed Williams and yeah. Jack Kent Cook to build this organization up, right. and and he did. And 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 George was an inspiring guy in a lot of ways. In a lot of ways, George was different. I mean, we know the stories of Tommy McVeigh and all the stuff that he did. But he was a coach, and he was a teacher. You know, yeah. George oh, he, was out there with the guys every day. He was obsessed. He he was oh, ob- boy. obsessed with football. And and Charlie Casterly tells a story that they're they're back at Redskins Park and they're practicing and Allen thinks you know the team just performed better when they were in Carlisle i think it was the water so he <laughs> orders Charlie Casserly to drive back to Carlisle and fill up buckets and buckets of Carlisle water so that he could give it to the team well you know Charlie didn't really drive to Carlisle he, he and McVeigh i know he, they filled up the buckets and yeah George this is Carlisle water <laughs> and, and uh, but but to think that he would go to that extent you right. know, to leave no stone unturned, that it was water. That, that was George. Yeah. Well, he hired the guy to watch the sun in the Los Angeles Coliseum. Did Ed Double O Boynton. Yeah. Who yeah. <laughs> used to ride around Redskin Park on a bicycle Detective. looking for spies. Yeah. But they also, you know, he, he did some spying on his own. Oh, absolutely. And the Cowboys used to practice at a, at a facility that was next to a Hilton Hotel. And one side of the Hilton faced out to the Cowboys practice field. So... <laughs> When the Redskins were playing the Cowboys that week, Dallas would have to buy out all the rooms on that side of the building. So George, because they were afraid George was planting some spies up there, looking it, at their practices. But it became a such an intense rivalry. Oh. Before that, the rivalry is with the Giants. Yeah. But George decided we got a Cowboys, the ones we got to beat. Yeah. It became so intense. The story about putting the chickens out on the field. Oh with, yeah. With corn and so forth. That was a true story. He was. He Tex was. Ram. He was. He was a a, a guy who. You know, he finally got in the Hall of Fame, but he was he was not he was blackballed from the league for a oh, long time. Oh, I know time. that. Yeah. And yet he did so many good things. We're going to be talking about that, Andy. And this is our town with Andy Polin and 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 Andy as I tell everybody, the man is a fountain of information and it's good information. Are you retired or soon will be? Is your will up to date? Don't want to leave a mess for your family to clean up. I'm attorney Mike Collins, the guy who sends you those invitations to my estate planning seminar. I'll teach you how to save taxes, avoid probate, protect your heirs from lawsuits, bankruptcy, even the divorce court. 
Keep your money and your family with our innovative Reservoir Trust. Watch the mail for your invitation. Tuition's free when you register online at MikeCollins.com. That's MikeCollins.com. You're listening to Our Town with Andy Ockershausen. Brought to you by Best Bark Communications. This is Andy Ockershausen. This is Our Town, and we're talking to Andy Poland, the book, as I call him. <laughs> Super over-the-air book. And I was telling Andy about some of the stories I know. He can he can top them all. But I, but playing and seeing a practice of the Redskins at a public playground, to me, is unbelievable when I see what they have now. But the whole league has changed, Andy. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's such a big business now compared Huge. to what it was. And it's it's so much money, you know, that, that, that the league generates. And, you know, we now have Thursday night football, and we have Monday night football, we have Sunday night football, we have games all day long. And it's it's... It's engulfed the entire sports world. I mean, there's no other sport that even comes close, comes close to the NFL. To no, now. Ba- baseball used to be America's pastime, but no more. Not Andy. anymore. Oh. You're so right. Now, in your in your vision of, of the Redskins and the things that you've changed, you mentioned Charlie Casserly. They, there's a whole new regime in place now, and we got to give them time. And I hope I hope this regime is the right one. Well, you know, it it, it seems like a simple thing. But hiring a general manager may have made all the difference in the world for this team. And Scott McLuhan is the first actual general manager that Dan Snyder has hired. Ever. Now, well, Marty Schottenheimer was president of the Redskins, so he was coach and president and general manager. And to a great extent, so was Mike Shanahan, although Bruce Allen had the had the title of president. Well, but, but remember they carried they hired Shanahan before they hired Bruce, if you remember. Yeah, yeah, and uh, that was a deal. Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, actually, actually, Bruce came in first, but it was known that Shanahan was right. coming. And so I, I think now you have someone whose entire business is players, and that's all he concentrates on. He concentrates on the draft. And he also is able to look around the league when they have holes at the end of the year that he can bring in guys off the street who can help them out. Will Blackman did that last year. Pierre Thomas. Those guys were big additions during the season, and that was one of the reasons they got to the playoffs. Absolutely. They were playoff additions. Yeah. Now, this we, we hope the baseball team's doing that now. But, and we all have our hopes for Andy, because even as a football guy, you got to love the fact that we have baseball, we have the Nats. You live through the years of dark years. You know, you, you'll remember this. Um, the Senators left town after the 1971 season. They, they were taken out of town by Bob Short, who was the same carpetbagger who took the Minneapolis Lakers to Los <laughs> Angeles. <laughs> he and, did it for money, yeah. Andy. But here's the thing about growing up at that time. I was 13 years old when I left. When they left, and they had been bad most of my lifetime. Though in '69, they finished 10 games over 500, and we we had a party. I mean, it was. But it, the Orioles won 110 <laughs> games. They won the division by 50, and you know they weren't going to be in the playoffs. But uh, when they left town. There was a feeling that they were soon going to be replaced by the San Diego Padres. Absolutely. We all thought so. Almost instantaneously. Don't worry. It'll be a year or less, and the Padres are coming here. And I thought, great. National League Baseball. I'm going to get to see Henry Aaron and Willie Mays and all these guys. The Dodgers were coming. Dodgers, all these teams. And then that fell apart at the last minute. If Joseph Danzanski owned Giant Food, was going to bring him in. Right. And, uh, and Ray Kroc came to the rescue, the McDonald's guy, and uh, and they stayed in San Diego. And we wandered in the desert for 34 years. Well, we had a base. shot. Remember the Houston story was out yeah, for yeah, a while? that's right. Steve Buckhans broke that story, as a matter of fact, that, that the uh, the Astros were going to move here. But we were used as a stalking ground. That, oh, absolutely. That if you wanted a you new want a stadium, stadium built, yeah, say so you're coming to Washington. Threatened, threatened with the Nets. And, and to, to see them come back in 2005, I mean, I, I walked in that stadium <laughs> that first night, and, and it was full, and the lights were on. And, you know, I had not been there for a regular season game since 1971. So, you know, do the math. Oh, my God. I, I, you, we walk in, and you go, oh, this is incredible. They played there for three years. They were bad for a while. But to think that they're They weren't bad when they first got here from Montreal, but then they began to degenerate. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing that happened with Montreal was they were going to contract the team. Right. So they said, well, if we're going to go out of business, let's get as many people in as we can. So they gutted the farm system trading for veterans. And the team that they brought here in 2005 was actually a pretty decent team. They but it played was an, well. It was an aging team. Right. And so they it realized. Wasn't the future. Yeah. They realized they got to build up the farm system. We're going to have to trade some of these guys for young prospects. And that's what they've done. Two two or three nights after the uh, the opening day, I think it was a night game, 
I asked Sonny, would he like to go to a baseball game? He had not been in that stadium since they closed it in when? Well, well the, the last time he played there was like 75, but they had closed it in 96 was the last year, right? The last year of the Redskins, yes, 96. So we went Florida. in and he walked in the stadium and he couldn't believe that, you know, how things had changed and so forth. They didn't have any year. And surprisingly, all the ushers and everything remembered him. Huh. You know why it's that big, ugly red head? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, figure. I, think, I think of all the people that played at RAFK Stadium, you know, Sonny's got to be two or three or one. I mean, who, oh, that's right. No yeah. question about that. I mean, that. You, you, Riggins had, had great, but I think, you know, the 11 years that he played. And they were stadium, bad teams and he stood out. Yeah, he was. That he, made the difference. He, he, he was probably the greatest pure passer who ever played the game. And and uh, loved it, and the fans loved him, and yeah. and then he had to he had to leave, and uh, with George Allen, he and George didn't get along, but well, everybody 40. loved Billy. He, remember Sonny and Billy oh, and all that. Do you remember the the, the campaign of seventy <laughs> three? Don't I the bumper stickers? The bumper stickers. <laughs> I like Sonny. I like Billy. And it was it was the strangest quarterback competition ever because they were great friends. They, they were doing it. They were doing the stop Theisman. <laughs> and they were both yeah, and they were both aging at that point. Absolutely. Well, Theisman the was out. the last year. Theisman was seventy four, but the campaign actually started in seventy three. Uh, and and I loved Sonny. It. You know, and and Sonny, I'm sure told you this story. If if he hasn't, uh, it's it's a great story. You know, he hurt his he, he tore his Achilles in '72 uh, in New York. In New York, like seven or eight games into the season, missed the rest of the year. Sonny took Sonny was 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 banished from the sidelines at the Super Bowl. Yeah, he he, he, he wanted he wanted to be there, and they told him to go up to the booth. And Billy Kilmer, you know that what the Dolphins did was they said, okay, we're going to stop Larry Brown in your running game and dare Billy Kilmer to beat us. And he didn't have couldn't it. do it. Part of it was that they had the crossbar up against the goal line, and he had Jerry Smith open in the end zone. And he hit the crossbar. Cross bar. But but Sonny, in years later, went to Don Shula's restaurant, which was called The Undefeated Season, his first one. Right. And he looked around at all the pictures on the wall, and he said, as he pulled his cigar out of his mouth, he goes, you know, if I'd have been healthy, this restaurant wouldn't be here. <laughs> and I, I think that's true. I think I think What a would, great story. I think he would have beaten the Dolphins. Oh, I, I think. think so, too. The yeah. Dolphins were, were ripe to be plucked, and Billy didn't have the skills no, to do it. Didn't do it, no. And he had to, Jake Scott meant two or three interceptions, didn't he? Yeah. Oh, well, I got a request from the uh, from the, the producer, from the who's, studio audience, who's yeah. the boss, Andy. Yeah, my, Janet Ocker's house. By popular is the demand, Morris Siegel has entered the studio again and again. Shocked that Ocker's house and is still sitting straight up. <laughs> the greatest mo. Anyway, Andy, thank you, thank you so much. This has been our town. As I told everybody, and I hope everybody knows, Andy Poland is a absolute book. He knows so much, and I love to hear him talk. Because what's past is prologue, Andy, and we keep running our business that way. What we did in the past works. We're going to do it again. I enjoyed this very much. And, and look, it's an honor to well, sit Andy, with you. Well, Andy, you're one of our favorites, I'm telling you. Well, I'm, you're one of my favorites as well. I, I told, uh, uh, what was your guy's name? That was Zier, Bennett Zier. Ben Zier. I said, Bennett, you ought to make Andy do the morning show. He didn't. He can talk and then get away with it. Bennett was one of your fans. You know I like that. Bennett. Bennett uh, Good Bennett's, guy. Bennett's now in Norfolk. Yeah. But you got so many fans, and we are, and Janice is a fan, and WML is a fan. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't do anything. That was a dumb mistake. <laughs> I, it was better than Hee Haw. And, and Andy Poland, sorry, we both did all right, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's been a great, great time, Andrew. Good luck to you. Thank and you. We're here for you, and we hope that you'll uh, remember this podcast, get it out to your listeners. Absolutely. I'll tweet we'll it out. out. This has been Our Town with Andy Poland. You've been listening to Our Town Season 1 with your host, Andy Ockershausen. New Our Town podcast episodes are released each Tuesday and Thursday. We welcome your comments and suggestions on how you like the show or who you'd like to hear from next. Catch us on Facebook at Our Town DC or visit our website at OurTownDC.com. Our special thanks to WMAL Radio in Washington, D.C. for hosting our podcasts.